Hey there, I hope you're doing swell. I'm Jake the Ashen Hollow. A majority of the story within Dark Souls is derived from pure speculation, as it was designed to do. We often find ourselves coming up with wild stories for our favorite characters, but this video series will be a little bit different. I want to tell the story of Dark Souls without the use of speculation, using only the undisputable facts we receive in the game to give a canonical outline of what is considered to be the main story in the game. In this series, we will only be referencing Dark Souls 1 and 3. Now, I know there are a lot of fans of Dark Souls 2 out there, and this is nothing against the game itself, but it has little to nothing to do with the story arc we see highlighted in 1 and 3. Even the most diehard fans of 2 can attest to that. Creating an accurate timeline in Dark Souls is quite challenging, and at some point we can simply only know a handful of events occurred before another, but we don't actually know the order in which those happened. So I've done the best I can in trying to put them in order that makes the most sense when coming across events with no solid timeline. And remember, time is convoluted. So without further ado, I give you Dark Souls. Our first perception of time is during the Age of Ancients, where we find the world unformed and shrouded by fog. It is a world filled with grey crags, arch trees, and of course, everlasting dragons. But then one day, fire appeared, and brought with it disparity, an imbalance in light and dark. And from the dark, the humanoids came and found the souls of lords within this flame, the Witch of Isolith, Nido, and Gwyn, though there was a unique soul amidst the flames, the Dark Soul, which was found by the furtive pygmy, so easily forgotten. Using the strength acquired from these Lord Souls, Gwyn and the others challenged the ancient dragons. The pygmies who acquired the unique soul, the Dark Soul, were petitioned by Gwyn to help in the battle as well. Though their knight's weapons and armor were forged in the Abyss, a place of darkness where humanity and or the Dark Soul draws its strength. In so, fearing this seemingly infinite strength, Gwyn cast a seal of fire upon their weapons and armor to contain it and keep it from spreading. These knights would go on to be basically used as cannon fodder in the war against the dragons and would receive no recognition for their deeds. So begins Gwyn's manipulation of the humans. The war had begun. Both sides fought hard, but the fight was proving more difficult than Gwyn had expected. For every dragon slain, the gods lost three score of their own. Gwyn's luck would soon turn, when Seath the Pale Drake betrayed his own kind. The secret behind the ancient dragon's immortality laid within their stone scales, so Gwyn took on the mantle of Lord of Sunlight, and he and his knights conjured bolts of lightning which peeled back the dragon's scales. It wouldn't be long until the gods had defeated their adversaries and the ancient dragons were no more. Qin, the Age of Fire the age Gwyn helped create when he defeated the dragons, and the age that, well, fire brought. In this golden age, most life would seemingly flourish. The gods are thriving, they erect grand civilizations, Gwyn created the beautiful city of Anorlando, the city of the gods, and things were relatively good. Gwyn granted Seath a dukedom, as well as granted him a piece of his own soul, and built for him the grand archives where Seath would begin his research into immortality. But as we know, all good things must come to an end, and that a fire cannot burn forever. So soon, the fire began to fade, and the world teetered on an age of darkness. Gwyn feared this dark, and recognized it for what it was. In this age, the humans would flourish. The humans would reign as gods over them, for their soul is made of this dark. The gods, fearing this impending dark, needed to find a way to stave it off. The first attempt at this came from the Witch of Isolith and her daughters. Using a soul, they attempted to recreate the first flame. Along the lines, something went wrong, and instead they created the Flame of Chaos. The Witch and her daughters, for all their worth, worked hard to keep this new flame under control. During this time, one of the Witch's daughters, Quailana, fled from her family and from her duties. She would return in the far future to feign ablution and pretend to seek answers, but to what end, we do not know. It's hard to pinpoint exactly how long the witch and her daughters were able to contain the flame, but chaos is true to its nature, and it could not be held at bay forever. Eventually, they were engulfed by the flame, as well as all of Isleth, and from this the bed of chaos was created, and from the bed of chaos, demons were born. 
Some of the witch's daughters were molded into disfigured beasts, spider-like demons. Some were seemingly unscathed, and some were and are missing, though there are certainly some rumors as to their whereabouts. As for the witch herself, it's hard to say. Some say that she herself became the bed of chaos. Some say she was completely consumed by the flame. Others believe that she escaped and disappeared into the world. The truth of the matter, though, is that we'll never know for sure. But the dark was still looming over Gwyn, and options were dwindling. More concerned about himself and his kind over the humans and the pygmy lords, Gwyn conceived a plan to manipulate them to his own gain. He gifted the pygmy lords great crowns and gave them a grand city, the Ringed City, at the world's end. He also gave them his youngest daughter, though he promised to return for her when the time was right. The Ringed City was used as a containment of sorts, to keep the Dark Soul cut off at the end of the world. Perhaps Gwyn thought that that would save him. The Way of White was a church, or a covenant, or maybe even a cult, depending on how you view things. But its purpose was dedicated to Lord Gwyn's Age of Fire, to preserve that fire by any means necessary. It was the most widely known and most commonly practiced religion in the world. In Gwyn's deception, even humanity fell in with the Way of White. Perhaps it was they never sought power, or perhaps didn't know. As we'll find out in time though, some of humanity certainly knew of the power they could achieve, and warred for it. So the pygmy lords sat at the end of the world inside their walls content to keep the Dark Soul in check. But the Dark Soul resides in all humanity, whether it was spread to them by the furtive pygmy upon finding the Dark Soul, or that is just the true nature of mankind, surely it could not be contained forever. With Isolith lost and the demons spreading, Gwyn stood on the precipice of yet another war. He took an army of his Silver Knights and descended into Isolith to snuff out the demon threat. We can't know for sure how long this war lasted, or how long the demons existed before Gwyn took the war to them. One way or another, Gwyn was also no match for Chaos. His band of Silver Knights had been charred black, and failing to defeat the demons he retreated. Gwyn was out of time. The Age of Dark had dawned, and his fire had burned away. Gwyn, knowing what he must do, had the foresight to first split pieces of his powerful soul among those he trusted and needed. A piece of his soul went to the four kings of New Londo, but we'll come back to them later. Gwyn commanded his people to shepherd the humans, and with no other choice he took off with his remaining knights to the kiln of the first flame. It was here that Gwyn sacrificed himself to preserve his Age of Fire. Using himself as the kindling, he ignited himself to reignite the first flame and bring back the Age of Fire. In doing so, he placed the same seal of fire he previously placed upon the abyss-forged weapons of humanity on the Dark Soul itself, creating the undead curse upon humanity. The humans were branded with the Dark Sign, an accursed symbol that marked them as undead. Cursed to never die, reborn after death time and time again, with each death they lost more and more of their humanity until one day they would go hollow. A hollow being an undead who has completely lost their mind, who lost who they were, lost everything of their humanity except for life itself. So the Age of Fire is restored, but Gwyn is but a hollowed husk of the powerful lore that he once was, the first Lord of Cinder. He stays at the kiln and sits in defense of the first flame, an eternal duty. The Way of White recognizes that the undead could pose quite a threat, so upon Gwyn's command to shepherd the humans, they led great undead hunts and corralled the undead into asylums, where the undying men and women are left to await the end of the world. Of course, not all undead would end up in asylums. Cue in the primordial serpents, two of them in particular. Let's start with Koth, and we'll talk about Framped later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's actually a picture of Framped! That's not Koth at all! <laughs> oh, you should have seen your face! <laughs> okay, alright, okay. Here's a picture of Koth. Anyway, not much is known about these mustachioed, toothy, primordial serpents. Their name suggests that we should at least assume they've been around for a long time, and as we'll learn, we have to take everything they say with a grain of salt. Koth makes his way to the city of Ulusil, known for its ancient sorceries. Far beneath Ulusil was the tomb of Manus, the primeval man. 
Koth was the serpent who was an advocate for the dark. He didn't believe in Gwyn's Age of Fire, and was searching for the one chosen to be the Dark Lord who will help bring about the Age of Dark again. As for his or any serpent's motives, ulterior or not, we'll never know for sure. Koth convinced the people of Ulysseal that they needed to awaken Manus. In doing so, they drove him to madness, until his humanity went wild as he endlessly sought out his precious broken pendant. As for what the pendant contained or represented, that again we may never know. But it is said of humanity that the will feels envy, or perhaps love, and despite the inevitably trite and tragic ending, the will sees no alternative and is driven madly towards a target. And so Manus became the beastly father of the Abyss. The Abyss itself began spawning off of Manus and threatened to swallow all of Ulysseal. So the fall of Ulysseal began as its land was plunged into darkness and its citizens disfigured into tainted creatures of the Abyss. Koth is also spotted in New Londo and played a role in the Four Kings Fall to Dark when he dangled the power of Life Drain before them. He incited the covenant known as the Dark Wraiths, which consisted of the Knights of the Four Kings. He granted them the art of Life Drain in which they could sap the humanity from other humans to preserve their own as they were intended to play their role in following the Dark Lord and ushering in the Age of Dark, the Age of Man. The Dark Wraiths could invade the worlds of other humans to pillage their humanity. They are commonly referred to as the Enemy of Man, yet that, as many other things in Dark Souls, is completely subjective. So we see the Abyss spring up in New Londo as well, as the King and his people willingly embrace the Dark. This is where we meet Knight Artorius, one of the four knights of Gwyn, who were Gwyn's most trusted and most competent knights in the War of the Dragons, and we'll get to the other three at some point down the road. Knight Artorius made it his mission to battle the Abyss at every turn. Artorius was known for annihilating Dark Wraiths in his quest to stop the Abyss. The Abyss in Nulando was different than in Ulysseal. While the Abyss itself is the same thing, in Ulysseal it was spawning from Manus, and in New Londo it was simply there. There was no conventional way to prevent the Abyss taint of New Londo to find its way to the rest of the world. So three sealers sealed the city up and flooded it with water. This was the only way to contain the Abyss here. Though it was an agonizing decision, countless lives lost, the robust culture of the city erased. The victims of the Flood would go on to roam the ruins as ghosts. Knight Artorius then set off to Ulysseal with his wolf companion Sif. Artorius had made a covenant with the beasts of the Abyss with the ring that symbolized this covenant, wearing it allowed Artorius to traverse the Abyss. So he and Sif descended into the Abyss to slay Manus and halt the spread in Ulysseal. But a hero such as Artorius has nary a murmur of dark, and would thus become corrupted by it. Before losing his fight to the dark, he used his great shield to place an aura around Sif to keep the wolf safe. Thus Artorius falls to the Abyss, and is nothing more than the creatures he had hunted. This is where things get interesting and a little confusing with how time works in Dark Souls. In the future, the world tells great tales of Artorius the Abyss Walker, the one who defeated Manus and stopped the spread of the Abyss in Ulysseal. Only that isn't what happened, is it? So we'll have to do some back and forth here and there, as much as I wanted to keep this in as close to a linear timeline as possible. Foolish me. For now, just hang on to the fact that the Abyss was indeed stopped in Ulysseal just not by Artorius. Let's pan over to Anorlando now, the great city of the gods. Guinevere, the eldest daughter of Gwyn, among the most notable, and the other gods had begun to flee from Anorlando. Gwyn was gone. The fire would eventually fade again. The abyss is getting all kinds of different landmasses pregnant. Shit wasn't just hitting the fan, it was getting smeared all over that poor fan. So they fled. To where? Who knows? But one god did stay behind. Gwendolyn, the god of the Dark Moon, Gwyn's youngest son. Though Gwendolyn was raised as a daughter because of his affinity for the moon, so they say. But don't worry, he wasn't voted Woman of the Year for hitting someone with his car, though. Lordran isn't as silly as my native country. Gwendolyn, though, was a master of illusion. The sun had set on Anorlando, and in its abandoned state it was incredibly depressing. 
So through illusions, Gwendolyn restored Anno Londo. The sun was shining, the sentinels were guarding, and Guinevere was back doing that thing she does with her tits. All was well in Anno Londo, or rather, all seemed well. So the Age of Fire continued. For how long this time? Again, we can't know for sure. Cue the flame starting to fade again. The world is on the precipice of dark. The story leads us to the Northern Undead Asylum. Here, locked in a cell, we find who will be the main character of the story for the foreseeable future, the Chosen Undead. Through a hole in the roof of the cell of the Chosen Undead, an unnamed knight of a store drops a corpse. On the corpse's person was a key to this cell. And yes, I'm going to continue calling the Chosen Undead a dude. It's not a gender thing. Please don't social justice my ass. The next main character later in the story will be female, alright? Deal? So escaping his cell, the Chosen Undead wanders the asylum in search of escape. He later stumbles upon the same knight that helped him escape his cell earlier, but the knight is gravely wounded. This knight of a story reveals to the Chosen Undead an ancient legend that thou who art undead art chosen, and that one day an undead will be chosen to make pilgrimage to the land of the Lord's Lordrun. And when thou ringeth the bell of awakening, the fate of the undead shall be known. The chosen undead continues to search for an exit, only to find it being guarded by the asylum demon. After defeating the demon, the chosen undead receives the key to the large gate leading out. The key is said to belong to the chosen undead pilgrim, which has sparked a lot of debate in the Dark Souls community. Are you chosen because you defeated the demon and received the key? Or did you only defeat the demon because you were already chosen? But this isn't a video for speculating, so feel free to chew on that one for yourself. So the chosen undead makes his way out of the asylum, only to find there isn't anywhere to go. The asylum is isolated in the middle of nowhere. Before he has time to scan his surroundings, a giant crow... Or is it a raven? I'm not quite sure. I'm not as efficient in bird law as Charlie. But either way, he's scooped up by this giant black bird and ushered to Lordron to begin fulfilling this ancient legend. So the Chosen Undead arrives in Firelink Shrine, which will be a focal point of his journey. It is here he meets a Firekeeper, even though she does not speak as she is impure of tongue. A Firekeeper is slated with a duty, to tend to the bonfires across Lordron. Each Firekeeper is a corporeal manifestation of her bonfire and is a draw for the humanity offered to her. Her soul is gnawed at by infinite humanity. The bonfires offer an undead a place of repose. It is at a bonfire they can burn humanity to regain their own. In a simpler analogy, think of the bonfires as a plane, the undead as a first class passenger, and the firekeepers as the stewardesses. Now the role is far more important and more difficult than that, but for analogy's sake, you know. So in Firelink Shrine, the chosen undead also meets a rather crestfallen warrior, but this warrior has very important information. He tells the Chosen Undead that there are actually two Bells of Awakening that need to be rung, rather than just one bell. One up above Firelink in the abandoned cathedral, and one down below in the ruins of Blighttown. After receiving the information that there are two Bells of Awakening to be rung from the Crestfallen Warrior, the Chosen Undead heads off to ring them both. He heads to the top of the abandoned cathedral to ring the first bell, only to find it guarded by gargoyles. After defeating these gargoyles, the Chosen Undead rings the first Bell of Awakening. He then heads deep down into Blighttown for the next bell. It's there that he encounters Quaylag, one of the Witch of Isolith's daughters. She was disfigured into a demon when her, along with her sister's mother, lost control of the Flame of Chaos. After defeating Quaylag, the Chosen Undead rings the second Bell of Awakening. Upon ringing the second bell, the giant gates barring off Sin's fortress are opened. It is a fortress that blocks the path to Anorlando to make passage to the City of the Gods. You must first master the House of Traps. The Chosen Undead returns to Firelink Shrine before continuing his journey. Upon returning to Firelink, the Chosen Undead meets Frampt, the other weird bitch. I mean, Primordial Serpent. Again, not to be confused with Koth, although I did get you good that one time. Now, unlike his counterpart Koth, Framp sided with Lord Gwyn and his Age of Fire. Still though, we cannot know any of the reasons or rhymes behind why these serpents do what they do. Those sneaky shits. 
Anyways, Framp tells the Chosen Undead that he was a close friend to Lord Gwyn, and that he wishes to elucidate the fate of the Chosen Undead to him if he agrees, and agree he does. Framp tells him that it is his fate to succeed Lord Gwyn, and to link the flame, cast away the dark, and undo the curse of the undead, but he first must go to An Orlando and retrieve the Lord Vessel. With this, the Chosen Undead makes his way to An Orlando, but not before traversing Sin's fortress. Inside of the fortress, the Chosen Undead crosses paths with a brilliant scholar, but not so brilliant as to not get himself locked in a cage. Either way, this good sir is Big Hat Logan, a very smart mage responsible for creating many of these sorceries we enjoy today. So the Chosen of Dead helps Logan out of the cage, and of course Logan is very grateful, and he escapes the fortress, and the Chosen of Dead carries on. Making his way through booby traps, guillotines, and the other dangers of Sin's Fortress, the Chosen Undead encounters his last obstacle, the Iron Golem, a giant sentinel created by the gods to guard the passage into their city. But of course, this is the Chosen Undead, the Catalina Wine Mixer of Undeads, so he has no trouble with this golem. After defeating it, the Chosen Undead is finally ushered into An Orlando by the Bat-Winged Demons. Why or how these demons are in the service of the gods? Well, you guess, because we never may know for sure. So here we are, the beautiful and, well, mostly abandoned City of the Gods. Now, of course, I know why you are all watching this video. You want the canonical lore behind these two twats. Well, let me shed a light on these assholes. Wait, no, n not like shine a light on a asshole. That's inappropriate. I mean, like, you know, these guys. Anyways, the big reveal is... There's no lore, they're just mega dicks. So as you could guess, the Chosen Undead runs into another obstacle blocking his path, but this is the mother of all obstacles. This is Dragon Slayer Ornstein, or Ornstein, one of the four knights of Gwyn and Executioner Smo. Or is it Smoff, or Smog, or Smoochie Poo? However you care to pronounce it. There's a bit of debate about whether or not the Ornstein here is the real one, or an illusion, or an imposter, etc. I've explored this in a few different videos, but as for an outline of the main story like we're doing in this series, it isn't super important. I just wanted to bring it up. So the dynamic duo of Ornstein and Smo proved to certainly be a challenge for the Chosen Undead, but nevertheless, he prevails. Awaiting him in the next room is the Princess of Sunlight herself, Gwyn's eldest daughter, Guinevere, or at least the illusion of her, though the Chosen Undead wouldn't know this unless he was naughty. So Guinevere gives him the same speech Frampt gave him. Succeed my father, Chosen Undead, and link the flame, blah blah blah. She grants to him the Lord Vessel, and the Lord Vessel allows the Chosen Undead to warp between bonfires and will become an important key of sorts in the future to come. So the Chosen Undead returns to Firelink Shrine to present the Lord Vessel to Frampt. He is, of course, pleased, so pleased, that he eats the Chosen Undead, and the story is finished. The end. <laughs> oh god, I got you again! <laughs> Just as you were letting your guardies back up, <laughs> the story- it doesn't end here at all! <laughs> oh, we're not even halfway done. <laughs> Alright, so he does kind of eat the Chosen Undead here though, but only to transport him to Firelink Altar. It is here that Framp tells the Chosen Undead to place the Lord Vessel upon the altar, and the altar is placed before a large door leading to the Kiln of the First Flame and the Lord of Cinder Gwyn himself. But it will not open yet, so Framp instructs the Chosen Undead that he needs to satiate the vessel with powerful souls in order to get the gates open. He says to retrieve the Lord Soul of the Witch of Isleth, to get Nido's Lord Soul, and also the bequeathed shards of Lord Gwyn's soul that he had given to Seath the Pale Drake and to the Four Kings of New Londo. So there's more people to kill and no time to waste. The Chosen Undead buckles up his boots and gets going. On his way back to An Orlando to find Seath in the Duke archives, the Chosen Undead passes through the Darkroot Garden. And this is one of those random and weirdish tidbits I have to put in there to make things appear as linear as possible, since these events are technically canon. In the Darkroot Basin, the Chosen Undead stumbles upon a raging Hydra, a multi-headed serpent, but our hero makes quick work of the Hydra. But beyond it, something catches his eye, a golden golem. 
He approaches the golem to find out that it is hostile. Of course, this is Mother Love and Dark Souls. After he vanquishes the golem, though, something peculiar happens. A woman appears. A woman who had been trapped within the golem. She thanks the Chosen Undead for rescuing her, and tells him that she is Princess Dusk from the land of Ulysil, though she is from a different time, from long ago, and that she must get back to her own timeline. She parts ways, offering to help the Chosen Undead if he ever needed it, to just summon for her. The Chosen Undead then arrives back in Anorlando and begins the path to the Duke's archives. The archives are filled with crystal golems and undead soldiers that have been crystallized. Basically, a lot of crystal shit is going on. Fighting his way into the archives, one of the crystal golems drops something interesting. Half of a broken pendant. The Chosen Undead doesn't quite know what to make of it, but there's a certain air of reverence and nostalgia that surround it, and the pendant is attached to a vine that appears to originate from Ulysil. Out of curiosity, the Chosen Undead returns to the Darkroot Garden to maybe ask Dusk what she might make of it, but he doesn't find Dusk, instead he finds a strange pulsing tear floating in the air. While inspecting it more closely, a giant hand appears from this tear and yanks the Chosen Undead through. The Chosen Undead now finds himself in Ulysil, but he is not in the Ulysil of now, from his time, but in the Ulysil of the past. He is greeted by a giant talking mushroom. Weird, right? Her name is Elizabeth, and she says she recognizes your aura because Princess Dusk described you after you saved her from the Golem. Elizabeth asks if you could play the savior once more because Dusk has been taken into the Abyss by Manus. Ah yes, Manus. Remember him from before? So the Chosen Undead obliges and heads off to find Manus. Before he can make it to him, a rather tragic tale stands in his way as he crosses paths with Knight Artorius. Remember him too? This is like a family reunion up in here. But this isn't the Artorius the world knows. It's the one who failed in his mission, and the one fallen to the dark. The Chosen Undead puts Artorius out of his misery and presses on to stop the Abyss and save Dusk. After reaching the edge of the Abyss, the Chosen Undead finds Sif, Artorius' wolf companion, safely trapped inside the ore Artorius had cast. The Chosen Undead eliminates the surrounding threat and the wolf can leave safely. After making his way further towards the Abyss, the Chosen Undead finally finds Manus. He of course defeats him and the spread of the Abyss is halted. So the Chosen Undead played the role of Artorius that the legend speaks of, only it was never Artorius who ended Manus, and the Chosen Undead would never receive recognition for this. Anyways, he saves Dusk again, and probably the whole world, and continues forging onward. He goes back to the Duke's archive in his timeline, and encounters Seath. Try as he may though, the Chosen Undead can't seem to inflict damage upon the Pale Drake, let alone kill him. It isn't long until the Chosen Undead is killed himself, though, hooray for our hero, he has the curse of undeath, so he's free to try again. This time after dying, however, he isn't teleported back to his bonfire. He arrives at a bonfire inside of a prison cell in the archives. Tricky Seath must have set this up. Lucky for the Chosen Undead though, the guard with the key is conveniently leaning up against the bars. So, cue in the easiest jailbreak of all time. Making his way through this new part of the archives, the Chosen Undead runs into Big Hat Logan again, who has, of course, gotten himself locked up. But, since jailbreaking here in the archives is a laugh in itself, the Chosen Undead has no problem springing Logan too. He joins Logan in the library of the archives, and Logan tells the Chosen Undead how to kill Seath. He says that his immortality is linked to the Primordial Crystal, and that in order to kill the Pale Drake, he would first have to shatter the Crystal. So the Chosen Undead makes his way to the Crystal, but Seath is hot on his ass. The Chosen Undead manages to shatter the Crystal, and the two do battle once again. This time, however, Seath the Scaleless falls, and the Chosen Undead retrieves the necessary piece of the Lord's soul he needs. The Chosen Undead then makes his way to the ruined city of Isolith. He finds there the Bed of Chaos, the creature created when the Witch of Isolith attempted to use her soul to recreate the first flame, and shit went south. He promptly unmakes this bed. Heh, <laughs> get it? Cause this, cause this is a bed? And he retrieves the Witch's former soul. He then makes his way down through the catacombs to the Tomb of Giants and finds Nido, the first of the dead. 
Nothing is stopping the Chosen Undead now, he easily puts the ass beating on Nido he needs and retrieves his Lord Soul. All that's left now is the Four Kings, but the Four Kings reside in the Abyss and that is a pretty tricky situation. The Chosen Undead needs a way to traverse it. Naturally, the Covenant of Artorius, a ring that allows its wearer to traverse the Abyss, is the obvious choice. The Chosen Undead heads back to Darkroot Garden, which is more and more seemingly like it's actually just friggin' Ulysseal, but hey, that's not technically canon. So he finds the Grave of Artorius, where I guess he assumes is where the ring is at, and some game mechanics are hard to squeeze into a canonical story. Just cut me a little bit of slack here, guys. The Chosen Undead soon finds he is not alone here. The Great Grey Wolf Sif shows herself, still guarding her master's grave. Sif remembers the Chosen Undead, though, remembers that it was he who saved her and he who relieved Artorius. As reluctant as this fight is, both combatants clash head to head in what is probably the single most tragic fight in all of Dark Souls. Gosh damn it, though, the Chosen Undead is victorious and Sif is. <sighs> Sif is slain. So the Chosen Undead receives the ring and leaves for New Londo. He arrives in New Londo only to discover a problem. It's flooded. He's going to need to pull the plug if he wants to make his way to the Four Kings. So he finds Ingward, the last sealer to stay at his post. Ingward of course knows his mission, cause everyone freaking does, and gives him the key to the seal. The Chosen Undead uses the key to break the seal, and New Londo is no longer flooded. To the Abyss he goes, and easily dispatches the Four Kings and receives the Shard of the Lord Soul. Now, he has all four things that he needs, he returns to Framp, who then returns him to the Altar. He places the souls into the Altar, and the door to the Kiln of the First Flame is open. Framp gives him a grand old pep talk, and the Chosen Undead is off to do what he believes is saving the world. There sits Gwyn. At the first flame, a hollowed husk of a lord, but still powerful regardless. The Chosen Undead defeats Gwyn in combat and is left alone at the kiln. The Chosen Undead, on the advice of Frampt and everyone else believing in Gwyn's Age of Fire, sacrifices himself in the same way as Gwyn to link the flame once again and bring life back into the Age of Fire. It works, the ages are reset, and the world is quote unquote saved. This story would happen time and time and time again. The world on the edge of dark and the flame rekindled. Who's to say how many times and for how long? If I had to guess, I'd say thousands of years. Probably even tens of thousands, but who knows. What is becoming evident though is how further and further the world is messed up every time the fire is linked. It's disruptive to the natural order of things and therefore has consequences, despite the overpopular belief that it's the only thing to do. Cue the story far into the future. This broken world is yet again on the precipice of dark. The bells begin to toll, and with it, four lords of Cinder, previous linkers of the flame, rise from their graves to come together and link the flame once again. But three of these lords refuse to return to their thrones, refuse what others believe is their duty. The bells keep tolling, and with it, now the unkindled rise. Four lords of Cinder are unearthed from their graves, and the unkindled have risen. The four lords of Cinder were supposed to return to their thrones to use their combined strengths to relight the flame. Of course, three of them didn't return, though one did, Ludlith of Corland. A quite small man, I guess you could say, a pygmy. Some people speculate that he could be the furtive pygmy himself, but that's a whole other thing. Despite his size, he willed himself a lord and linked the first flame during his time. The other three lords were Aldrich, the saint of the deep, once a cleric but developed a habit of devouring men. He became so bloated that he turned into sludge, so they made him a Lord of Cinder, not for his virtue, but for his might. Yorm the Giant, a reclusive Lord who linked the fire in an attempt to put the profaned flame to rest. Yet, when the fire was linked, the profane capital was consumed by flame. The Abyss Watchers, bound by wolf's blood of a covenant forged long ago by an abyss walker and his wolf companion. This also served as their mandate as lords. Farron's legion traveled the lands combating the spread of the abyss. It is said that if you saw the legion at your doorstep, your kingdom would surely be buried. 
There is technically a fourth, but it's a little tricky without speculation. It is Prince Lothric of the Lothric Bloodline, a royal family obsessed with creating a worthy heir to the flame, even by unspeakable means. Only, a scholar would convince Prince Lothric against linking the flame, and Lothric's brother Lorien would take on his brother's curse of being an heir with him, and together they sit and wait for fire to subside. So he never technically linked the flame, so it's kind of weird that he'd be considered a Lord of Cinder. Now there are some reasons as to why that can be, but it does require a lot of speculation, so we're going to leave that out of this series, but we do talk about it in other videos and we will talk about it in the future. Now the Unkindled Rise. An Unkindled being someone who at some point tried and failed to link the flame. This is where we meet the protagonist for the foreseeable future. An Unkindled One. The Chosen Ash, and or Ashen One. There's a lot of monikers for this shit, and of course, as promised, this role will be given to a female. Thank you very much for not social justicing my ass. So our heroine rises in the Cemetery of Ash. Through the distance is seen Firelink Shrine, but she won't arrive there without triumphing over some obstacles, naturally. But she presses forward anyways. The Chosen Ash enters into an arena of some sorts. The roots of a giant tree hang all over the place, and in the center is a being. A being who has become the scabbard for a coiled sword. The Chosen Ash removes the sword from his chest, and if Dark Souls has taught us anything, it's that even when you're trying to help, everyone just wants to fucking kill you. So the fight between the Chosen Ash and Eudix Gunder begins. The coiled sword was placed into Gunder to await none other than the Chosen Ash, him or herself. Gunder serves as the judge over them to determine who is worthy. Of course, proving your worth basically means just whoever can kick his ass. Kick his ass, the Chosen Ash does. Which leads us to the same philosophical question we received all the way at the beginning of the Chosen Undead story with the Asylum Demon. Is the Chosen Ash chosen because she defeated Gunder, or was the reason she defeated him because she was already chosen? Feel free to chew on that. Anyways, after defeating the Eudix, the Chosen Ash arrives in Firelink Shrine. Not to be confused with the Firelink Shrine we saw back when, though. Here she meets her Firekeeper. We learn something new from the Firekeeper here, though, that we didn't know before, or didn't see practiced before. Fire keepers are forbidden to have eyes, so just hang on to that wee bit of info for now. So the fire keeper tells the chosen Ash that she tends to the flame and tends to thee, that the lords have left their thrones and must be delivered to them. She tells the chosen Ash to produce the coiled sword at the empty bonfire, and that the mark of Ash will guide thee to Lothric where the homes of the lords converge. Now whether these lands are converging due to some sort of magic, or a side effect to the linking of the flame so many times, or is simply what happens when the world is near its end, is a deep question itself, but not one we can answer without speculation. So upon producing the coiled sword, the Chosen Ash can now warp between bonfires, not unlike the effect of the Lord Vessel. So she uses the bonfire and is taken to the High Wall of Lothric. It is here that she meets High Priestess Emma. She tells the Chosen Ash that the Lords are not here, that they've returned to their churning homes at the base of Lothric Castle. She gives the Chosen Ash a banner and says to raise it just past the Great Gate to proceed forward. This gate is naturally guarded by a horrible beast named Vorn, but the Ashen One does make quick work of him. She raises the banner and is escorted by the same demons that escorted the Chosen Undead to Anor Orlando to the Undead Settlement. The Chosen Ash fights her way through the settlement and arrives at the Road of Sacrifice. So from here, there are a lot of directions that can be taken. There isn't a canonical order in which the lords are slain, so again, I'll just have to wing it there. So for this story, the Ashen One will head to the Cathedral of the Deep first to find Aldrich. Arriving at the Cleansing Chapel right outside the Grand Cathedral of the Deep, the Chosen Ash stumbles upon an older man. This man is praying to a merciful goddess and mother of the Forlorn. Now there is a bit of speculation in the community here as to who that goddess can be, and I obviously won't get started on it in this video series, but y'all can already bet your ass I'ma say Belka, because who the hell else that gonna be? No one. But it isn't canonical, so I'm just gonna Hakuna Matatas and carry on. So this man is praying for fire for Ariandel before he notices you. 
he rudely does not introduce himself to the Ashen One, but for the sake of knowing who I'm talking about, his name is Gale. Upon meeting the Ashen One, he becomes quite excited. He says that she doesn't know how long he's searched for her. He then asks for a favor. He says that his lady lives in the cold land of Arian Dell, and he needs the Ashen One to show her flame, a proper flame that will burn the rot away. The Chosen Ash agrees to help, and Gale pulls out an old rotted scrap of a painting and tells her to touch it. Upon touching it, the Chosen Ash is sucked into the painted world of Arian Dell. So the painted world is an interesting place. It is obviously in a painting. Now I'm unsure if this painting is actually an original Van Gogh. That's what I heard at least. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So in this painted world, a rot has begun to set in. And well, it's rot, so we know that that can't be a good thing. The painted world was led by a being named Father Ariandel, and eventually he would be joined by a woman named Elfrida. So something we learn about the painted world from one of its denizens is that when the rot arrives, they burn the world away for the sake of the next one. Something unlike how those people in the outside world do. Obviously, this is in reference to how the flame is linked time and time again regardless of what it's doing to the world. The people here in the painted world understand that things aren't forever, so they accept the inevitable so the next world isn't a shit show. Where was this dude when Gwyn was around, am I right? But the rot is here, and the flame to burn it away isn't anywhere to be seen. Well, what happened was, when Lady Frida came to the Painted World, she convinced Father Ariandel to bury the flame. So Father Ariandel sits below the chapel in the Painted World, over top of a large bowl that contains the flame, and whips himself to use his blood to appease it. Because Ariandel knows that only blood can appease the flame. So the rest of the world is left to rot. This is where the Ashen One comes in, and Gale's search to find her. In the Painted World, the Ashen One finds a young-looking girl locked away. She is a painter, and she must paint the next world. This is the lady of whom Gale said to show flame. For when the flame arrives, the rot will burn away, and this painter can paint a new world. Of course, the Ashen One sets her free, and she's off to go get ready to paint. So there is still a lot going on in the Painted World, but since in this series we're trying our best to follow a linear-ish main storyline, we don't really need to go into everything else, so I just gave you a rundown of sorts. Anyways, the Chosen Ash goes and kicks Frida and Ariandel's teeth in, and then the flame begins to burn the rod away. Before leaving, the Chosen Ash checks on the painter who is now in the top room of the chapel sitting before her massive canvas. She thanks you for showing her flame, and states that she is waiting on Gale to bring her the pigment to paint the next world. She then reveals that the pigment she will paint with is the dark soul of man itself. So that was a pretty huge bombshell, and of course incredibly interesting. So the Ashen One returns to the cleansing chapel where she found Gale to begin with, but he is no longer there. So back to slaying Lords of Cinder it is. She makes her way through the Cathedral of the Deep now, but at Aldred's coffin she discovers that he isn't here, but it is guarded by his Deacons of the Deep. The Ashen One slays these Deacons and discovers amongst one of their corpses a peculiar doll. Listening carefully, she can hear the doll speak. It says, Wherever you go, the moon still sets in Irithyll. Wherever you may be, Irithyll is your home. Naturally, she hangs on to this weird murmuring doll, and to her luck it will be a key later on in her journey. So of course the Ashen One is successful on her mission to slay all the Lords of Cinder. She finds the Abyss Watchers inside Farron's Keep, Yorm is holed up in the profane capital amongst the death and destruction he caused upon linking the flame, and then there's Aldrich, the only Lord not technically where he should be. With the help of Pontiff Sullivan, a dude straight out of the Painted World, he devoured the God of the Dark Moon, Gwendolyn, Lord Gwyn's youngest son, himself, and eagerly awaits the Chosen Ash inside the very room of An Orlando that the Chosen Undead fought Ornstein and Smo. So the world is falling apart, everything we know is dead and gone, but this is a nice little bit of nostalgia, if you can look past all the bad shit. The Ashen One then seeks out Prince Lothric, who is waiting inside Lothric Castle, and of course whips this little weirdo's ass. So with all the Lords of Cinder slain, and their ashes ready to produce upon their thrones, the Unkindled One means to take her leave back to Firelink Shrine. But first, she stumbles upon something interesting inside the corridors of Lothric Castle. 
Following this route, she encounters a very peculiar beast, a pale drake of sorts. This is Osiris, the former king of Lothric, and through his desire to create an heir to the flame and his fascination with the studies of Seath the Scaleless, he was transformed into a pale drake himself, though it does seem likely he's gone mad. And in the Dark Souls fashion, he wants to murder our protagonist. Succeed he does not, though, and the Ashen One has triumphed over another foe. Something is off, though. It seems that Osiris was either hiding or protecting a doorway, and of course our hero marches right on through it. This is where things get a little weird. The Champion of Ash finds herself back in the Cemetery of Ash, where she was arisen from at the beginning of the game, and you have no idea how many takes it took me not to say Cemetery of Ass. Yet, these graves are untended. Now, if you've played the game, you'll get that magnificent pun. If you haven't played the game, then go play the fucking game. But something is off about this place, though. It's the same cemetery, but it's completely dark. Almost like she is in another dimension, or perhaps traveled either backwards or forward through time. Gunder is still in the same arena he was in before, but this time he has no sword through his gut, and he's much more powerful than he was before. So perhaps this could be the past. But the Asher One naturally defeats Gunder here as well, and she takes a 2-0 lead in their best of 5 series. So after defeating him again, our hero makes her way into the darkened Firelink Shrine. Here she finds in the bonfire a broken piece of the same coiled sword she placed in at the beginning of her journey. So perhaps this could be the future. But like with most things in Dark Souls, we'll never know without a doubt. And that's okay. But trying to perceive which timeline the Ashen One is a part of here isn't the most interesting thing about this place. The most interesting thing is what she finds in a back corridor of Firelink Shrine. Amongst several corpses belonging to old firekeepers, she finds a pair of eyes. Which is peculiar, because if you remember what I told you in the previous video about firekeepers being forbidden to have eyes, then you'd find this interesting. So naturally, the Ashen One puts these eyes in her pockets and heads back to the normal, for all intents and purposes, Firelink Shrine. It is here that she gives the eyes to the firekeeper, looking for some sort of explanation. The Firekeeper tells her again about how she is forbidden to have eyes, but she thanks her for the eyes either way, and says that they will reveal to her a frightful image of betrayal, and a world without fire. She asks if that is what the Ashen One wishes, to which she replies, yes. The Firekeeper tells her that this will be their private affair then, that the Ashen One should stay her path, and that she will blindly tend to the flame, until the day of their grand betrayal. Which, real quick, I think is fucking badass that the Firekeeper is just immediately on board with all of this. Anyways, the Firekeeper continues to say that the eyes show her a world without fire. A world that has ended the linking of the fire. A world that is just a vast stretch of darkness. But, in the far distance, she senses a presence of tiny flames. Like precious embers left to us by past Lords of Cinder, linkers of the fire. Now this is incredibly interesting and something we've actually seen before, but I'll talk about this again when we get the final piece of info we need. The Firekeeper ends with telling the Ashen One that if she changes her mind that she should kill her and strip the eyes from her corpse, and that she will return to the Firekeeper that she once was. So the Ashen One continues her duties. She places the ashes of each lord upon their respective thrones. The Firekeeper steps to the bonfire and tells the Ashen One to kneel before it. Our hero kneels before the bonfire and the ritual begins. Noble Lords of Cinder, the fire fades, and the Lords go without thrones. Surrender your fires to the true heir. Let her grant death to the old gods of Lordran, deliverers of the first flame. It is then that the Ashen One arises from the bonfire, but yet again at a different Firelink Shrine. This one is broken down and shows us the true nature of the world around us. Did the Chosen Ash travel through time or dimensions again? Or is she simply being revealed what the world truly looks like from behind the mask of what Firelink Shrine previously showed her? I guess that's up for you to decide how you want to perceive it for your story. So she steps outside and uses the bonfire there to warp to another bonfire down below, because rappelling down cliffs isn't a thing in this game. 
In front of her now is the kiln of the first flame, where everything began and everything will end. Yet something else catches her eye. Behind her is yet another bonfire, which seems a tad out of place. She investigates this one before proceeding forward, and can you guess what happens next? It warps her somewhere else, for the love of God. Fret not though, this rabbit trail is actually quite important. She has arrived in Dreg Heap. What is Dreg Heap, you ask? Well, there's a nice old lady our hero's about to talk to that will explain. She tells the Ashen One that at the close of the Age of Fire, all lands meet at the end of the Earth. And that's quite literally what Dreg Heap is. It's where all the lands have converged in on each other. It's quite a big clusterfuck. And I won't go on a rant or anything, but I think it's super interesting that she says at the close of the Age of Fire. Because when the Chosen Undead linked the flame, the world was not doing what we're seeing it do here. But the Chosen Undead was prophesized to link the flame. So perhaps the Ashen One's grand betrayal is prophesized because we see the world's evidence that the Age of Fire is coming to a close. Just something to chew on, I suppose. Anyways, here in the Dreg Heap, the Ashen One discovers clues left behind by Gale. In the last she heard of Gale, he was looking for the Dark Soul itself, which is kind of important, you know, so she follows the clues he left behind as guidance. These clues lead the Ashen One to the Ringed City. The same city, if you remember from the first video in this series, that Lord Gwyn gifted to the humans along with his youngest daughter as part of his schemes. As she makes her way through the Ringed City, she learns of a woman named Filianor, who apparently sleeps for the sake of man. Now, I don't know if I can say that canonically Filianor is Gwyn's youngest daughter he gave away. The game basically all but specifically says, yes, she is that daughter. But it's one of those things where everyone's like, come on now, just say it, we already know. So I guess you just kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. The Ashen One eventually makes her way to where Filianor rests, and we see her asleep leaning upon an egg. What it means that she sleeps for the sake of man is kind of up for interpretation but we'll see sort of what it means, at least here in a second. The Ashen One, for all her curiosities, walks up and touches Filianor's egg. Yeah, I know, right? The egg immediately crumbles. Filianor wakes up and then, boom, a big flash of light. Now, all of a sudden, the Ashen One stands before a very much dead and withered Filianor, and the world collapsed around her, almost entirely buried in sand. Now, what all that means is up to speculation. Whether her sleeping for man is what kept the Dark Soul in check, perhaps, and we're seeing the extent of its power and what would happen if she didn't sleep, or maybe we see a similar facade that we witnessed in Firelink Shrine when the Ashen One received the ritual of the bonfire. We can't know for sure, which is like the catchphrase of this series. So the Ashen One walks outside and sees a figure in the distance. It is one of the pygmy lords that took on Lord Gwyn's bribe and has sat here in the ringed city keeping the Dark Soul in check. But he's dragging himself through the sand, fearfully fleeing from something, muttering about the Red Hood who has come to eat their Dark Soul. So the Ashen One follows the trail he has left in the sand. She stumbles into what appears to used to be the throne room, and there are dead pygmy lords all over the ground. It is then that she sees a very large and very deformed Gale devouring the Dark Soul of one of the pygmy lords. He becomes enraged, apparently not remembering the Ashen One, and who would have thought it, tries to kill our hero. Halfway through the fight, Gale begins to bleed, and he states that it is the blood of the Dark Soul itself, the blood of the Dark Soul that would be the pigment for his lady's painting. As per usual, though, the Ashen One is victorious over her foe, and from Gale's fallen, Dark Soul-corrupted corpse, she takes the blood of the Dark Soul. Gale had sought this blood out himself so that he could bring it back to his lady as the pigment for her painting, but when he arrived he discovered that the pygmy lord's blood had long ago dried, so consumed the dark soul instead. But Gale knew that he was no champion, and that the dark soul would likely ruin him, and that he had little hope of a safe return. And I guess that is where our hero comes in. Some think that Gale consumed the dark soul because he craved power. Some think he knew that him consuming the Dark Soul was the only way to create the pigment for his lady since the blood of the Pygmy Lords had long dried. So he led the Ashen One to him because he knew the Ashen One was the only one who would help him and the only one who could slay him and bring the blood of the Dark Soul back to his lady. 
and a final ultimate sacrifice for a new world. But again, that is up for you to decide. So before heading back to the Kiln of the First Flame, the Ashen One visits the painted world of Arendel for the last time and gives the painter the blood of the Dark Soul. She thanks the Ashen One and begins to paint this new world. She says it will be a cold, dark, and very gentle place, and that one day it will make someone a goodly home. She then wonders when Uncle Gale will return. Sad, I know, right? Now it's time for our hero to finish things up. She heads back to the Kiln of the First Flame to find it guarded by the Soul of Cinder, an amalgamation of all the previous Lords of Cinder. This is quite a long and difficult fight for the Ashen One, but she inevitably prevails. And from the Soul of Cinder, she receives a Soul of the Lords. So this is another one of those things that might technically be considered speculation because they don't outright say it in the game, but because they're so close to just saying it and it's so incredibly interesting, I'm going to briefly share it with you to ponder on. So the Soul of the Lords is something we've seen before. It's a Lord Soul. So we learn that a Lord Soul consists of the souls of Lords of Cinder, people who linked the flame in the past. That's interesting, sure, but that isn't all I'm talking about. Remember what the Firekeeper said? That even after the fire is gone and everything is in a vast darkness, that she sees in the distance a tiny flame appear, left to us by past linkers of the flame. That's almost quite literally what happened all the way at the very beginning of our perceived time and what I talked about in the first video of the series. In the darkness, a flame appeared one day, and in it were Lord Souls, aka souls of the past linkers of the flame, that Gwyn, Nido, the Witch of Islet, and the Furt of Pygmy found. The Firekeeper is seeing all that happening again in the far distance after darkness has taken root. So I don't know about you, but I think that's super cool. Anyways, standing over the first flame, the Ashen One summons the Firekeeper so that they can end the Age of Fire. The fire keeper removes the flame from its mantle and it slowly begins to burn out. This is the end of our journey with Dark Souls. Though like the eyes suggest, the Age of Fire will reappear one day through the embers left by all the past Lords of Cinder. Though who knows if it will play out the same or differently altogether. That isn't for us to know because our time in this universe is over. The Age of Fire has ended and as darkness begins to set, we hear this. The first flame quickly fades. Darkness will shortly settle. But one day, tiny flames will dance across the darkness. Like embers linked by lords past. Ashen One, hearest thou my voice still? 